Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone here on this beautiful spring Sunday. Despite the fact that it's January 29th, we'll take it. A call to worship. All you searching for truth and joy that lasts more than a day. All you wanting to give yourself to something larger than yourself. All you have been riding the roller coaster of right of life. All you hurting, abused, or confused. A hymn of adoration this morning is "O oh, Worship the King." Let us pray. Faithful God, we thank that you have given us your promise and we know that you will never go back on it. We can count on you to be there for us in any difficulty and in every joy. We have, you have brought us through the storms of adversity and given us the perspective to enjoy the goods of the earth as gifts from you, not as items we deserve. In your son's name, we say, we pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy day. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our responsive psalm is Psalm 15. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk faithlessly and do what is right and see the truth from their heart. Who 
do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor heap shame upon their neighbors. Who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Now let's take a couple of seconds to say good morning to everyone and those of us viewing us on TV. Hello everyone, happy Sunday. A couple of announcements. We have our ongoing mission for the St. Mary of the Bay Food Pantry. Uh, we're collecting food items to be uh, taken for those who are less fortunate. Those who are in need our daily bread, the booklets for March, April, and May are now on the uh, table at the entrance. Any other announcements at this time? Go ahead, Jeff. Just so everyone knows at home, the boiler on our, our first floor has given way, and next week the service will be held in what was the thrift shop in the Juror building. Yes? I take it everyone could hear that. Okay. Anyone have any prayer concerns? Yes. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? N Nancy, your sister Nancy. And we'll always pray for Barbara, who's at home, and, and Colette, who's at home. It just, so, you know, we missed them here, and we're glad to see Kathy this morning. And we thank her daughter for bringing her. There's progress with Colette. There's progress with Colette? Well, that's good news. Any other good news? No? Nobody won the million. Okay. Okay, let us. One of the kids lose a ring. Could be from last Sunday, too, never know. Okay, let us be in the spirit of giving as we give our offering to the Lord.
Let us pray. Eternal and always loving God, we are here to praise you. You bring us light and life, and you bring us new life in Jesus Christ. In all your giving, may we find strength and guidance for our daily living. Take now our lives and our gifts and dedicate us anew with vision, hope, and courage. We bring these gifts, O oh God, to you, and we bring our lives. Consecrate us to faithful living in our lives and in our families, at home, and at work, in school, and in all daily living with grateful thanks. Amen. Our hymn of worship is Rescue the Perishing. Hello. <laughs> Our scripture reading is from the book 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 through 31. The Christ the power and wisdom of God. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise 
and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the uh, debater of this age? Has not God made foolish uh, the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to abolish things that are so that no one might boast in the presence of God. In contrast, God is why you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Lindsay, for saving me. I love to hear the little voices. I know it's disturbing to others, but it, it's so warming, I guess you would like to say. What does the text say? Two perspectives of the cross are contrasted here. For those who are perishing, the cross is foolishness. For those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul also says that both Jews and Greeks have misunderstood the cross because of their respective religious and cultural biases. According to him, Jews demand signs, while Greeks desire wisdom. For Jews, the cross was a sign, not of power, but of weakness. Consequently, it was a stumbling block. For Greeks, the cross was devoid of wisdom, therefore it was foolishness, that is, utter nonsense or madness. However, for believers, it is a sign of the power of God. The believers in Corinth were neither wise by human sta standards nor of noble birth. In other words, their very presence in God's kingdom shamed the wise, the strong, and the things that are, thus demonstrating God's power and wisdom. Furthermore, since God was the source of their life, they were not to boast in their own abilities, but only in the Lord. Time for silent meditation.
May we pray. Gracious and holy God, it is not an easy time to be the church, but in truth, it has never been easy to be the church. You have set us apart to respond to our enemies with love, not hate, to desire mercy and justice rather than power and wealth, to align ourselves with the marginalized, the ostracized, the powerless, and the downtrodden of our society and our word, our world. You have called us to be a beacon of peace in the midst of war, to offer hope in the face of despair, disillusionment, and disgrace. You have given us the profound privilege and responsibility of showing the world the person of Jesus Christ through our words, deeds, and attitudes. Strengthen us, we pray, for this great call and mission. Make us worthy to be your messengers, and where our faithfulness fails us, we pray for your mercy and grace. We especially pray for your grace upon Cheryl's brother-in-law, Vincent, still fighting cancer. The souls of the three young Duxbury children who have returned to heaven. Priscilla and Scott Amy, now that Scott Amy is home. Deb's sister, Nancy, who's having surgery. And the good news, Joe is home. And Colette, who we missed, um, is trying to stand making new progress at the rehab center. Gracious God, there are so many people from whom the circumstances of their lives make rejoicing difficult. We pray for all who live in places of strife and conflict, that they would be filled with your peace. For the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hymn of petition is, Hover over me, Holy Spirit.
may be seated. Our scripture text this morning comes from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, the Lord's case against Israel. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I have brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people remember Balak Balak and king of Moab plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from the Shittim to the Gigal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Micah had some advice for the Rolling Stones. It's like an old man dancing like a chicken and singing, said the teenage girl, laughing uncontrollably as she watched the video in her bedroom. Her father, a professor named Arthur Brooks, poked his head into her room to see what was going on. In a second, he figured it out. She was watching rock star Mick Jagger, who turns 80 this year, singing the Rolling Stones hit, I Can Get No Satisfaction. This song has been a favorite of baby boomers and Gen X's for decades. It hit the pop charts when Professor Brooks was just a year old. After all these years, Jagger still can't get no satisfaction. Writing in The Atlantic, Brooks said that as we move through life's satisfaction, the joy for fulfillment of our wishes, our expectations, is passing from memory or disappearing. No matter what we achieve, see, acquire, or do, it seems to slip from our grasp. Satisfaction, I told my daughter, is the greatest paradox of human life. We crave it. We believe we can get it, we glimpse it, and maybe even experience it for a brief moment, and then it vanishes. But we never give up on our quest to get hold and to hold on to it. Or as as Mick Jagger puts it, I try and I try and I try and I try and I try. Brooks is right. Happiness so quickly slips from our grasp. We crave it, we find it. We feel it, and then it disappears. Poof. As we go right back looking for it again, we are always on a search for satisfaction. So how can we hold on to happiness? Listen to what the Lord says, says the prophet Micah to the people of Jerusalem in chapter 6, verse 1. It was from the rural village of Moresheth in the land of Judah. And his book begins with the prophecies of doom directed toward Israel and Judah. Because the leaders of the people despise justice and distort all it is right, Micah said that Jerusalem become a heap of rubble. Chapter three, verses nine and 12. Okay, so what was going on in Jerusalem? The leaders were looking for satisfaction. Jerusalem's leaders judged for a bribe said the prophet. Her priests teach for a price and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Chapter three, verse 11. Micah saw people in power were trying to get ahead in business, government, and religion. 
and they were using corrupt and unjust practices. Even history repeats itself. In particular, rich landowners were exploiting vulnerable people in the community, much like today. They covet fields and seize them, said Micah. They defraud a man of his home, a fellow man of his in inheritance, chapter two, verse two. In Jerusalem, the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer as this was happening on a playing field that was anything but level. But Micah was not interested in only exposing justice. He predicted that a shepherd king would ri arise to rule Judah. The new ruler would come from a little town of Bethlehem. He would be a rural, rural savior who was not part of the wealthy Jerusalem establishment. So here's a spoiler alert. The ruler's name is Jesus. Then the prophet accused the people of not being satisfied with God's goodness to them. Listen to what the Lord says, said Micah. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery, chapter six, verses one and four. Are you not satisfied? I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam, verse four. Are you not satisfied? Remember your journey for Shittim and Gilgal, crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land in verse five? Are you not satisfied? God brought the people out of slavery, gave them wise and powerful leaders, and brought them into the Promised Land. And yet the people of Israel and Judah can't get no satisfaction. No matter what they achieve or attain, they want more. Instead of enjoying the good life that God is giving them, they resort to corruption and injustice to satisfy their wishes and expectations. The Lord has a case against his people, said Micah. He is lodging a case against Israel, verse two. There were hard words for the people to hear. I'm sorry, these were hard words for the people to hear and some of them immediately felt guilty. They asked the prophet what they could do to make things better. With what shall I come before the Lord, they asked, and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, in verse six? No, said the prophet, forget about your burnt offerings. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with 10,000 rivers of oil, in verse seven? No, said the prophet, God will not be pleased with rams and oil. Shall I offer my firstborn for transgression, said the people, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul, in verse seven? Are you kidding? Human sacrifice? No way, said the prophet. Like so many of us today, the people of Jerusalem wanted to cut a deal with God. They were lifting up a foxhole prayer the kind we might offer in times of grave danger, which Priscilla discussed in last week's sermon. Heal me, O Lord, we might say after receiving a cancer diagnosis. Answer my prayer and make a huge donation to the church. These foxhole prayers are understandable, but they don't bring us any closer to God. They end up being transactional, not relational. They send a message that we want to show our appreciation to the Lord but we, really, but we don't really want to change our lives to get closer to God. This seemed to be true for the people of Jerusalem. They would be happy to make a burnt offering, but they were not going to stop taking bribes. They would be willing to give the Lord some rams and oil, but they were not going to reform their unjust real estate practices. They would gladly give up their firstborn child but they were not going to stop committing fraud. The hunger for satisfaction is powerful, isn't it? We are pleasure-seeking creatures, and we will do almost anything to preserve what makes us feel good. When Mick Jagger sings, I try and I try and I try and I try, he is talking about the effort we put into the search for satisfaction, even at the cost of our ethics, morals, integrity, 
marriages, and families. So we have a simple answer. Micah reveals the true secret to happiness. It has nothing to do with money or power or real estate holdings. The prophet says that God has showed you, O man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God, in verse eight. This is shockingly simple, isn't it? Acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God are, the, God are the keys to our true satisfaction. Micah clearly states, says biblical professor Daniel Simonson, that God is more interested in the way people live their ordinary lives than in their religious practices. When we behave in this way, we are able to hold on to happiness. Act justly. This is not wishful thinking about the administration of justice in the world, but a set of concrete actions that advances fairness and equality for all of God's people. In particular, to act justly means to work on behalf of people who are weak or powerless or exploited by others. Acting justly is the opposite of what is the rich landowners of Jerusalem are doing as they exploited vulnerable people in the community. Love mercy. The Hebrew of this commandment is a little bit tricky because the word mercy is hesed with a common word in the Bible, but not one that can be translated neatly into any one English word. Yes, it means mercy, but it also means kindness, grace, loyalty, and faithfulness. To love her said is to love all these qualities which are so important in a relationship with God and with the people around us. This is similar to what Jesus said to the Pharisees when they questioned why he was eating with tax collectors and sinners. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, Matthew 9, verse 13. Walk humbly with God. Once again, the challenge is concrete action. Walk humbly. This means to travel forward with God and walking in God's way, to stay close to God. This means, it means to remain humble as we make this journey because God is all powerful and cannot be manipulated by burnt offerings or rivers of oil. When we travel this way, we are mindful of our behavior because we know that God is challenging us to act justly and to love mercy. The promise of this verse is the gift of satisfaction. When we act justly, we tend to have good relationships with the people around us. When we love mercy, we can feel as though we are in step with the Almighty God. True satisfaction does not come from the property or power of money. It comes from being right with God and right with the people around us. Amen. I hymn a benediction is come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove.
As we go forth, may God give you courage to walk in the paths of peace, patience to outlast the troubles of the day. Kindness that touches hearts, gentleness that cherishes the children and joys creation. Amen.